a dream can be greater than a dream? In Genesis 38, we're going to be presenting a story, and the issue with this is he mentioned pride, and this has to do with pride, and it's how we twist pride. We love to twist pride, meaning we like to say how humble we are because of our twisted pride. And our twisted pride looks like this. We'll say, I can't do that. That sounds like humility. Well, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not eloquent enough. I'm not whatever enough. And that sounds like humility at first. But if you think about who you're telling that to, how much less humble could it be? When we tell God, you can't do that with me. Mm. This morning we had that story of the, the clay in the potter's hand. And it's as though we as clay will say, well, God, that's not in us. It's not in us that you could make us into something like that. And in Genesis 38, we're going to be looking at Judah. And, and the issue with Judah is this. Judah's not that important from the surface. Because, obviously, we've got, we've got four brothers. Well, there's 12 of them, but we don't really care about the rest right now. We've got Reuben. He's the oldest brother. He's the most important. He should be ruling. He should be taking over. He should be leading his family. He should be the heir to the throne. He slept with his dad's wife. Um, always a bad situation. And so we have two brothers left. We got Simeon and Levi. Levi, the Levites. He's the holy one. If we remember what Simeon and Levi did. When their sister was defiled, they tricked them. In Judaism, it's not acceptable to trick people, even if you're trying to kill them. Sorry, it's against the rules. But he did. they did. They said, well, you need to get circumcised. And then when they were being circumcised, they waited until they were good and sore, and then killed them all. Mm -hmm. so, so they were rejected because they broke the rules. They made... Israel distasteful to all the nations. Because what did they know about Israel? Don't trust them. Because they're going to trick you and then kill all your people. Bad situation for you. But tonight we're going to look at Judah and this is where Judah shows his true colors. And this is where most of us would get that really good humility where it goes, God, now that I'm here, you can't use me. Genesis 38, starting in verse 1. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Dolomite whose name was Herod. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son and he named him Ur. Then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan. She bore still another son and named him Shelah. And it was at Chesed that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord took his life. Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife. And perform your duty as his brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground, in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord. So he took his life also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I am afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Did you notice who God says is at fault twice? He says, Ur was evil in the sight of the Lord. Onan did something and was displeasing in the sight of the Lord. None of it says anything about Tamar. He doesn't say, yeah, they married Tamar and her wickedness rubbed off and then God killed her. But that's exactly Judah's plan. Judah's going, well, I'm going to protect my youngest one. I've only got three sons. It's her fault, two are dead. 
I'm going to protect that son, and I'm going to keep this widow. And we have to do a little bit of backtracking and not think of it in modern days, because we have a lot of widows. There's no real issue there. But in this day and time when you need a male, you need an heir. I mean, when you get old, who's going to feed you? The, the only social security they had, the only way that they could prepare for their future was have children. You know, if you had 12 kids, you had a good retirement fund. That, and I want you to get it kind of like that because I don't want you to look at her as a widow in modern day. I want you to look at her as a widow and she's got nothing. She's got no social security, no 401k, no retirement pension, none of that. Because at the time, what is all that? All of that is children. Because you had property, but the problem is, if you're just a little old widow woman, what good is property you have? And you rent it out to people and you may not get your return. And so God prepared in his love for everyone a way to protect widows. He said that you marry a widow and then you die without producing children. The brother needs to produce those children. So that that widow is not left alone as a widow with nothing. But this story continues because we see the corruption of Judah going, it's Tamar's fault. This widow woman with nothing that's getting blamed. But we continue. She's actually very shrewd and smart. Verse 12. Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to a sheep shares at Timnah, he and his friend Hira, the Adolamite. It was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enum, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that Sheila had grown up, and she had not been given to him as wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Here now, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me, that you may come into me? He said, Therefore I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, Moreover, Will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, What pledge shall I give you? She said, Your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her, and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed, and removed her veil, and put on her widow's garments. He just gave her a blank credit card. I don't know if you got that. He just gave her the seal. The seal is the same thing we would say credit card. He legitimately said, I'll leave this credit card with you. I'm going to send you a lamb and get my stuff back. But I don't have anything with me right now, but I do have this credit card. That seal, that insignia that will allow pretty much for a borrow on his name. And this shrewdness here. Because Tamar realizes that Judah's not going to help her out. She's a widow woman with very little opportunity, very little chance at the time. And she's looking at what do I do when I get old? And she's being mistreated in a way by Judah that I, I want you to get how bad it is. I don't want you to look at this and go, well, Tamar does something terrible. She does. But Judah has already wronged her in a way that most of us could understand. Most of us could look at that and go, you're just going to leave her to die with nothing? You're going to leave her to have nothing? And this is wicked Judah. Continues in verse 20. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adolamite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he didn't find her. He asked the man in the place, saying, Where's that temple prostitute who was by the road by the Anum? But they said, There has been no temple prostitute here. So he turned to Judah and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the men in the place said, There has been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, Let her keep them. Otherwise, we will become a laughing stock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you didn't find her. Now, it was about three months later that Judah was informed, Your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold, 
She is also a child like heart tree. Then Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. There you go. There's good Judah right there. Yeah. Bring her out and let her be burned. We can finally get rid of her. I was just going to have her die destitute. Let's just burn her instead. It was while she was being brought out that she said to her father-in-law, saying, I am the child by the man to whom these things belong. And she said, Please examine and see whose signet ring and cord and staff are these. Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, inasmuch as I did not give her to my son Sheila, and he did not have relations with her again. It came about at the time she was giving birth, that behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth, one put out a hand, and the midwife took, tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came about as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out. Then she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. So he named him Perez. Afterward, his brother came out, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and he named him Zero. Judah has something going for him that nobody else seems to have in the Old Testament. In this story, I mean, we've, hopefully you figured out just how bad a guy Judah really is. You figured out it's not just him about, I'm not going to give you my youngest son, it's I'm going to let you die with nothing. And then when I figure out you've cheated, even though I was never planning on letting you marry my youngest son anyway, I'm ready to burn you. But Judah does the one thing in Christianity that makes all the difference. He says this beautiful phrase. She is more righteous than I. And Tamar <coughs> is in the lineage of Christ. Because through Judah is how we get Jesus. But there's something important here that we get. We need to get that Judah's wickedness is really out there. We need to get how extreme his wickedness. So we can look at him and say, okay, I've got 12 tribes now. Judah, I noticed you. Okay, good. Uh, let's skip on to the next one. You remember they're picking David in the hole? They're like, okay, bring out the brothers and then we'll leave him out there. Somebody's got to watch the sheep. Right? And so they're like, leave David out there, we don't even need him, and we'll just count him off from the start. Seems like Judah's working pretty good for this. Because what happens to Judah's sons? One, two, dead. Judah should be stricken out of this, and we should say, okay, God, bring out the 11 tribes and see who's going to be your leader. Who's the one who's going to raise up the Messiah? Who's the one who's going to be the most influential in all the tribes. And so they bring out 11. That would make sense, right? Just kick Judah out so we can save time. And when it comes time to bless them, that's not what Israel does. He doesn't go, bring in the 11. Just leave him out in the field. Somebody's got to work the field. He brings them all in. And he blesses Judah. This terrible Judah. Because Judah at this point should have said, really, everybody knows it now. There's this woman who's pregnant, who is married to his son. Judaism tells you that's bad even, okay? That's, that's in the Leviticus, they both died in works. Leviticus tells us, hmm, they both need to die for this. This is a bad situation no matter what society we're in. Somebody who doesn't care about widows. Somebody who we would define as, as evil as possible. We're going to take Judah. But Judah is the most righteous of all his brothers. When it comes time to bless him, Israel makes it perfectly clear who the most righteous child is. And it's Judah. And this kind of goes with our morning idea of <coughs> repentance. It, it, it's not really looking at them and going, this person you know, seems upright. 
This person seems like, you know, they're a lawyer, seems like they're a Pharisee, seems like they're the scribe, they're, they're the built up, they're the strong ones. Levites, even. <coughs> and looking at this one and going, Tamar, she pretends to be a prostitute. Actually, that fits really well tonight. Tamar, prostitute. Judah, mistreater of widows. And one who consorts with prostitutes. I see, I use big word. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, we're not looking at Judah and going, this seems reasonable. We're looking at Judah and going, you can see why I'd say, you know, bring up the 11 and just leave this one behind. But that's not how Judah does it. Judah comes out and comes out with this repentance. And this is in the middle of a story that most of y'all think is about who? Who does everybody think is? Joseph. Joseph. Everybody's going to tell me this part of scripture is all about Joseph. So let's think about Joseph. How many kings come from Joseph? Come on. It's, it's less than one. Huh? 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 It's a half. Okay. Zero, right? How many priests come from Joseph? Um, Joseph. Let's think through the rest of the Bible. I told you there's a story within a story within the story. How many of you remember anything about Joseph's people? There's a half tribe of Manasseh and a half tribe of Aphra. Okay, game over. We don't even read much more about it. When Judah splits off, it's the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, and you know, they're the northern kingdom, they're the good guys. Kind of twisted. And then the southern kingdom, they're the rest of the leftovers. Half tribe of Manasseh, half tribe of Ephraim. And I want you to see that in the big story, Judah is essential and Joseph is just this little minor character. He gets his, you know, five minutes of fame. He, he rescues them from something, a plague, starvation. <clears throat> but Judah... Is a real leader. Because he just got caught red-handed, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously she's pregnant. He said, burn her! Right? And then they go out there and he's like, don't burn her. She's, she's more righteous than I. Yeah, I'm just going to say, uh, don't do the burning thing. I don't want to be burned now. And that's the, that's the real concept we're getting is him getting caught. And instead of going, yeah, well, she tricked me, she did. She, she covered her face. He couldn't tell who she was. Clearly, her face was covered. Jews don't do that. Jews don't cover their faces. So, so he sees this woman, and her face is covered, and he doesn't know it's his daughter. He doesn't, and he's been tricked. And, and earlier, when his sons are dying for their own misdeeds, he's blaming her, but all of a sudden, he sees it, and he goes... It's not Tamar, it's me. It, it's not wicked Tamar who deceived me and tricked me. It's wicked me. And this same Judah is the one that God uses. Because you see how this would not be humility at all. I mean, honestly, this is not humility at all. It's not. You don't look at this and go, Judah is the example of humility because. You know, is it humility to mistreat the poor? No. Bad idea again. God gets really angry and kills nations for this. Don't do it. Is it humility to blame the wrong people. No, it's, it's not humility either. Is it humility to the second you find out they did something, the one you've been wronging the whole time, and go, burn them? That's not humility. None of this is humility. And yet Judah is a great example of humility. Because his pride gets hit. And instead of rebuilding his pride, 
We do. How many times do we get it? Somebody says something against us and we're like, but y'all know the right hook, right? The right hook? No, no, it's, 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 we do it all the time, especially when we're in trouble. Somebody that's, you know, more authoritative than us. The police are like, what happened? I wasn't there. Uh, you know, we get in trouble, we get sent before somebody magistrate, and we're like, okay, how many names do I need to drop so I can get out of this? You know, what do I need to tell you so I can disappear? But he doesn't. He, he's caught red-handed, and he, he says, instead of defending himself or relaying his story, he says, she's more righteous than I am. Judah realizes that he is inferior to this trickster, prostitute. Whoa. Remember this, this Jesus who comes later? And he says, I'm going to change how you think about everything. There's no more Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. I'm going to just throw it all for a loop. God was already doing it in the Old Testament. God was already throwing it for a loop. God was already picking the wrong people, making up the wrong team. He was already doing that for us. We should have been used to it. We said, God, you're using the wrong people. Now, Judah right here, Judah has made a huge mistake. So let me tell you how the story should go if I wrote it. Joseph, remember? Joseph should have a tribe of people rise up for him. The king should come from Joseph. Joseph should be the one that we're like, you remember Joseph, how he led our people. You remember Joseph, how he was the leader of his brothers. You remember Joseph, how great he was. But I would have to rewrite the rest of Scripture to do it. I honestly could not look at things the way that God does. But neither can we. We, we can't look at things the way God does. Because He's perfect. And we are so quick to decide one of two things. Judah's Jude, got a situation where he can decide one of two things. Judah is a terrible example for Israel. Let's stay away from my brothers. He's already left his brothers, right? He's, he's off somewhere else. Stay there. You're going to make your daddy look bad. Two, he remains that pride from this, which we don't need to keep because he defended a young widow instead of himself. And that's where we fit in. We, we, we will do one of two directions. We will either be prideful in the sense that we will think we are better than we are. And we, we are God's gift to everyone. Or we'll be prideful in the opposite direction. Where we say, God, let me tell you how smart I am. Let me tell you that I'm so smart that you can't use me. Let me list off some factors. And I go to Galatians 3.28 because I just love the idea of a <clears throat> female slave Gentile, okay? I mean, I'm trying to make as many bad things on a person as I can. Cursing them as much as possible. We have a slave, a female, and a Gentile. Okay, God, yeah, you're going to do that, sure. You're going to use that. I'm, I'm honestly telling you, at that point, in the middle of Judaism still having its power, if you're a slave, it's pretty rough. If you're a female, pretty rough. If you're a Gentile, pretty rough. <clears throat> and what that slave, female, Gentile can do is say this, God, you can't use me. God, I don't even have my freedom to give you. God, I understand that under Judaism, you can't use me. God, I understand that as a Gentile, I should be cast out of your temple. And today we can do that exact thing. We can look at our situation and classify, <coughs> classify ourselves as one of those three. Because Gentile was, was the image of 
You have the holy people and the unholy. We are the unholy people. And we can say, God, I am so unholy, you can't use me. I, I am so unable, I don't... I'm not one of your scribes. I'm not a Levite. I'm nothing there. And we can say, God, you can't use me. And that is just as much pride as saying, God, I can do everything. Because you're telling God you know more than him. When we think of slaves, it's the idea of having nothing. Having no control, you don't even own your own life. If your master decides to separate you, you have what you're wearing. And we can go to God and we can say, I don't have enough. Enough time, enough. The ways we describe wealth is having time for pleasure, having money, having influence, having all these things. And we can say, God, I don't have those things. You can't use me. Or we can do one of the worst and say, well, God, I'm not the right sex. Excellent. And I told you exactly how I feel about those apostles who don't even show up on time. I don't know if they didn't ask for directions or what, but they didn't show up. I mean, women would have asked for directions. They would have been at the, they were at the tomb on Sunday morning. And I've heard so many things against women, and the only issue I ever got to was, have you ever realized that the first person you're told to go preach Jesus is Mary? Remember, she's a prostitute. We're really big fans of the scripture. I don't know why. <laughs> prostitute and a female. <coughs> I didn't write the book, guys. She shows up on Sunday morning. And Jesus says, go tell my apostles. Those guys that have been following me, you know, the leaders, these apostles, highest position. Go tell those guys who don't show up. Mary, can you be my preacher? Can you go tell those apostles what's really going on? Ooh, ooh. I think I ruffled feathers there, didn't you? But we can do any of that. And it is very common for those tonight to do just that, is to tell God why he can't use us. And I, I told you before my story, and how much this little woman who taught English, I hate English, don't worry, she taught English to us and read those fancy English stories that I have no clue what they meant. I didn't learn a lot in the class, but I learned everything in her class. Remember, female, She's a teacher, so you can guess she's broke. Um, right? Gentile, obviously. And she shares her faith with me. Because it wasn't about a pride. It was about a humility of saying, God, you could use anyone. I'm something. I, I may not be anything great. I may not be anything special. But I know that to you, God, you are God. And if God wants to take a clay pot and make something beautiful, he can. And that's what God does with us. Mm -hmm. Is he says, get past telling me that you know what I can do. <laughs> get past telling God the reasons why he can't use you and telling him that you want to be used. Say, God, I want to be used, and it doesn't matter what position I am. It doesn't matter what kind of sins I could describe myself as. What matters is, do I have a heart that can be used by God? Humility enough to say to God, I don't think you can use me, but I'm wrong. I don't see how you could use me to do something in your kingdom, but I'm wrong. And give God the chance to prove you wrong. That's true humility. Tonight we close with an invitation. It's, it's a little different. It's Hebrews. Good Hebrews. I love Hebrews.
And it's all about Jesus. It's all about Judah. Because I told you all that, and I didn't want to you know, jump too far ahead and tell you that it's essential that Jesus comes from Judah. Because he's our king. He has to come from Judah. But he's also a priest forever after the line of Melchizedek. The line of this person who disappeared and nobody has seen from. In which God doesn't really make the same distinctions he used to. In which God doesn't place the Levites and say you're special. He says, you are my temple. You are my vessels. You are my high priests. You are all priests. You are all possessors of the same Holy Spirit. And so God offers an invitation as He always does. We mimic it here, which is fine. And He asks us to believe that Jesus is Lord. To repent of our sins. To confess Jesus as Lord. To be buried with Christ into His death so that we will be part of His resurrection. And then to live for Him as His temples and as His priests. That invitation He offers us. But if anybody also needs prayers, or if you wish to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing.